Good morning. This is 7th grade social studies and I'm Miss Dina Vandenbosch and let's learn some geography together. Today we're going to be looking at our standard of 7.3 which is describing ways that urban areas impact um, surrounding areas. We're also going to throw in another one that we'll look at in greater detail next week but that's 10.1 and that's looking at natural hazards that impact this region. So let's get started with our where in the world segment. Um, this week's clue number one says that it's located in South Asia. And if you've already guessed it, you're good. Clue number two, it took 20,000 workers and 22 years to build. Hmm. Some of you may know if you've been doing your work this week. Clue number three, it's a popular honeymoon destination. And then finally, clue number four, it looks like a castle, but it's really a tomb. Hmm, can you guess it? And those of you who guessed Taj Mahal, you're absolutely correct. This is a beautiful structure in Agra, India. It was built in the 1630s by Emperor um, Shah Jahan. When his wife died in childbirth, he was um, hoping to build a memorial to her beauty and to her love. Um, it's a white marble mausoleum, so it's actually a place where she's entombed, um, and the United Nations has um, designated it as a World Heritage a Site. Um, it's a beautiful example of a mix of different architectures, Persian, Islamic, and Indian architecture. So as you've guessed, we're going to be looking at um, South Asia for today's objective. And our essential question this week is, what are the impacts of dense urbanization in this area? So let's get right to it. Um, New Delhi, India, which is the capital of India, is about 7,500 miles away from our capital in Washington, D.C. We're going to first look at our political map of South Asia. And as you can see, South Asia is dominated by one particular country, India. South Asia is often looked at as a diamond-shaped chunk of land. And the countries that are there are India in the green, Pakistan to its west in the yellow, Nepal in the orange, the smaller country in purple of Bhutan, and then Bangladesh. And then you may be looking for the other two. Well, they're island nations. Um, Sri Lanka is down at the um, southeastern tip of India. And then the Maldives. And you may not even be able to see the Maldives on your screen. It's a series of small islands. There's about a thousand islands that make up the Maldives to the southwest corner of India. In fact, those Maldives We've learned this word before, earlier this year, archipelago, which is a chain of islands. The Maldives are about a thousand islands. Many of them are not inhabited. They're small coral islands that are very low in sea level. In fact, they estimate that many of these will be underwater in the next five to ten years. Let's take a look at the physical map of South Asia. Um, the Indian subcontinent, as this area is often known, is dominated by a couple of physical features. Um, but let's look at our bodies of water first. To our west, we have the Arabian Sea, which is what the Indian Peninsula borders on the west. Then to the east, we have the Bay of Bengal. And then, of course, to the south, we have the Indian Ocean. And then the Indian subcontinent is very, uh, rivers are very important to this area. So we have the Indus River, which actually starts in the Himalaya Mountains and then empties into the Arabian Sea. We have the Ganges River, which again starts in the Himalayas and empties into the Bay of Bengal. And then in the area of Bangladesh, we have the Brahmaputra River, which starts again in the Himalayas and then empties into the Bay of Bengal. Let's look at our elevation. Um, if you look at the elevation at the, um, scale at the bottom, you can tell that green is going to be at sea level. We get into the yellows and oranges, but then as you get into the red color, that's when you're talking about 10,000 feet or above. So you can see where the, the elevation is here on the Indian subcontinent. And you've got the Himalaya Mountains right there that explain that. Those are the highest mountain range in the world. We also have um, an area of low-lying um, land, which is the Ganges Delta. And this is a very fertile area where the Ganges rivers and others meet. 
We also have a desert in India. Um, it's on the border between India and Pakistan, it's called the Thar Desert. And then a lot of India, the peninsula, is called the Deccan Plateau, which is relatively flat land at high elevation. But most of the people live in the Ganges Plain, which is an area of fertile land for growing crops um, along the Ganges River. And then just wanted to mention that there are several natural barriers that have contributed to India's history throughout the years. Um, the very longest border that India has is with the ocean, um, but of course it's also got the border of the Himalaya Mountains, um, which those tall peaks have really prevented it from being um, uh, bothered by its neighbors to the northeast. Um, the Thar Desert kind of protecting it from any type of um, activity with Pakistan. Those are its two neighbors that it would have the most conflict with. So let's stop for a viewer question. Some of you may have heard that I've said the word Indian subcontinent. So you may have heard of a continent. What's the subcontinent part? Well, a subcontinent, you won't hear it often, but South Asia is typically referred to it. It's an area distinct from the rest of the continent. In this case, it's separated by the Himalaya Mountains. So a subcontinent is just a large distinguishable area of a continent, um, relatively self-contained or separate. Um, the Indian subcontinent used to be separate. It used to be um, its own tectonic plate and 50 million years ago kind of basically crashed into the Eurasian plate which formed the Himalaya Mountains. So speaking of the Himalayas, the tallest peak in the Himalayas is Mount Everest. Um, it's also the tallest peak above sea level in the world and it's 29,000 feet and growing as those two um, continental tectonic plates continue to push against each other. Um, it stands on the border of Nepal and Tibet, which is an area in China. Let's do some more visual vocabulary. I mentioned delta before, the Ganges Delta. A delta is an area where a river meets its mouth, um, where it empties into a body of water, and it typically deposits rich sediment there. So um, because of the way it kind of fans out, it often has a triangular or a fan shape, and that's where you tend to have very fertile land, which is good for growing. Another visual vocabulary word to know for this region is cyclone. And a cyclone is a tropical storm in the Indian Ocean. We know what a cyclone is. We just don't call it a cyclone here in Alabama. We call them hurricanes, as they're known in the Atlantic. They're also called typhoons in some parts of the world. Um, but these are the storms that bring torrential rain, uh, devastating winds and flooding and other destruction um, during the summer months. Monsoon is a word that we need to know when we're talking about South Asia. A monsoon is a seasonal wind that affects this part of the world. And wet monsoons bring months of rain. Imagine it starts raining and it doesn't stop for three to four months. That's what they deal with. They also have the dry monsoons that bring dry air. Um, and they have wide ranging impacts for this region. So let's take a, uh, some, take a look at some pictures of the wet monsoons. In some areas of India and Bangladesh, they can expect anywhere from 100 to 300 inches of rain per year. They need that to fill their reservoirs so that they can withstand the entire year um, because when the dry monsoons come, they won't have that same water. They use it to irrigate their crops. However, it does cause floods and mudslides, so it's a double-edged sword. But it's interesting and fascinating to me that life continues to go on in South Asia and it's incorporated into their daily life. And this is what an area looks like during the wet monsoon, that same area during the dry monsoon. You can see what a big difference that makes. So dry monsoons are the opposite time of year, um, typically November to April, where little rain is uh, falling. The winds are blowing from the Himalayas south, unlike um, the southeasterly um, uh, winds that bring it from the south. Um, and a dry monsoon can really destroy crops in this region um, and deplete what water resources they have. So South Asia is definitely impacted by the monsoons. So you may have heard me say a dry monsoon and you're wondering, wait a second, I thought a monsoon was rain. Well, technically the monsoon is the wind and not the rain. So a monsoon can be wet or dry. A lot of time when we talk about it's raining outside, it's like a monsoon outside. Well, we're technically 
kind of thinking of the wet monsoon there. Let's do some South Asia quick facts. South Asia has India, which is the world's second most populated country behind China. We also have, as I mentioned, the world's tallest mountain range, the Himalayas. India, with its um, over one billion people, is actually the world's largest democracy. Two uh, religions started here, Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, the majority of those living in India are uh, Hindu. About 98% of the world's Hindus live in India. Um, there are also Muslims and other religions here. The two countries of Pakistan and Bangladesh are predominantly Muslim, and um, India is predominantly Hindu. India actually has the second most English speakers in the world. Um, because of its large population and because of the legacy of uh, English colonialism, they have um, a lot of English speakers that work a lot of jobs today um, that are outsourced to India in the customer service, um, call center industry, and also in software development. And um, India gained independence from Britain in 1947, which led to its um, current borders and partition. Um, and you'll learn a little bit more about that in world history. Let's look at a population density map. I'm showing you one that's in your textbook, and you can see where the red is. And that might not be that impressive. Um, so I wanted to show you a different one that uses the map maker we've been looking at. Remember this from last week and the week before when we looked at the um, population density of Africa, and you can really see the Sahara Desert? Well, let's look what South Asia looks like by that same map maker, okay? And what constitutes the difference? Does that mean that there are more people on this map than the other? No, it means that the scale of the maps are different. On the other map, it could be that one dot represented 50,000 people, and this one uses a different scale. So using the same scale as we've been using, you can really see what? That South Asia has a high population density, okay? And you can also see some areas where you don't see um, population, and that, it, and that can be explained by physical features, okay? Right here in western India and right on the border of Pakistan, you have an area known as the Thar Desert. Not many people live in the desert. Along here, you've got the Tibetan Plateau and the tall Himalaya Mountains. Again, not many people living there. But you can see the dark red right here on the Ganges Plain, the Ganges Delta. You can even see the outline of the Indus River right here, that squiggle there. And we can also look at this South Asia at night, the satellite views of lights um, on the, the subcontinent at night. Again, you can see those same features, the squiggle for the Indus River and all of the different major cities. This is Calcutta, this is Mumbai, uh, Mumbai. Uh, this is New Delhi. So let's take a look at South Asia by the numbers. These are all the seven countries of South Asia, their land area, and their estimated population. And this is a couple of years old data. Um, they are in alphabetical order, but we've got the United States there just as a reference point. And the big story here is, is India's population. Let's take a look at that. Um, for the size of its land, look at its population. According to this, and again, this is dated, the population was 1.1 billion people. Um, let's compare that to the United States, okay? So let's find the United States. The land area of India compared to the United States, it's a smaller country, but let's take a look at our population, 310 million, and again, this is dated data. Um, so you can see that they have a much higher population density. Let's look at Bangladesh, find Bangladesh. Bangladesh's land area um, and comparing that to the United States, Bangladesh has 50,000 square miles compared to the United States. Um, so it's about um, one-seventh of the size of the United States, but then its population is about one-half of the United States. Um, one thing that can also be notable about this area is the population growth that is being seen in some of these countries. And in looking on the graph, you can see that India unlike its um, other um, neighbors, has a very high population growth that has really contributed to its, its population numbers. In fact, it is outpacing China to be the world's most populated country in a few years. 
So let's look at a couple of populated urban areas in South Asia. It has some of the most populated cities on earth. Um, Delhi, India, Mumbai, India, Dhaka, Bangladesh, Kolkata, India, Karachi, Pakistan, Lahore, Pakistan, and Bangalore, India are some of the world's biggest cities. In fact, India has seven of the top 30 cities in the world and three in the top 10 alone. Uh, one of those cities is Delhi, India. Um, you may have heard me say New Delhi earlier. Well, it's New Delhi is the capital of India. It's part of this urban area. This urban area alone has 28.5 million people. Um, and there's the, a beautiful Hindu temple there. Um, it's the largest city in India and the second largest urban area in the world behind Tokyo, Japan. And um, Delhi is a cultural and political capital of India and a real commercial center. A lot of business is done there. A second city in South Asia is Mumbai, India. It's formerly known as Bombay. Um, has about 20 million people. Um, it's the second largest urban site in India and the seventh in the world. And it's a real commercial and financial hub of India. And you may have seen some movies that take have been filmed from um, their version of Hollywood. They call it Bollywood, um, which is their film industry. It it's, makes more movies actually than our own Hollywood does. It makes more movies than any place in the world. So what are some challenges of urban area? Let's get back to that a central question for today. So many of these cities have kind of outgrown themselves. So many people are trying to come to the city for employment that they're lacking housing. Um, many cities have areas that are called slums and shanty towns where um, housing has sprung up that are in um, unsafe ways. They're substandard. Um, they're not sanitary. Um, the crowding conditions can also be seen in the streets and in the building projects. Um, much a lot of traffic congestion in these cities. You're also seeing urban sprawl where the city is actually expanding outward which causes its own um, subset of conditions. Um, growing suburbs and that's led to actually increased pollution, air pollution from um, factories, smog from the cars that are on the um, street and many of the rivers in India are polluted from sewage and industries. Mentioning slums and substandard housing, this is one of India's largest slums. These are the Davari slums in Mumbai. Um, they're the largest, um, I, I should say, the most populated slums, but it's actually the, the land area is just under a mile. Imagine this, 700,000 people living in a square mile. Um, that's a lot of people that live in these slums. Um, these slums were created um, based on factory jobs um, in Mumbai, people wanting to work in the leather and pottery industry, textile jobs, and they came faster than the city could really accommodate them. So a lot of the housing kind of was set up as sub, um, haphazard with no plans, and now they really are have some poor conditions there. Um, so just tracing an imp just one impact of dense urbanization, we can take a look at how that impacts people, is a growing population and poor waste disposal, just one thing, would then end up as pollution in perhaps the Ganges River or the Indus River. That then results in less clean drinking water for people, and then that of course has health impacts. So you can see just how um, critical these issues are. One um, city in particular, Vara uh, Varanasi, India, is a sa sacred Hindu city. Many people um, come here, it's on the banks of the Ganges River, which is considered holy to Hindus. There are a lot of temples and shrines set up on the banks of this river where people um, uh, celebrate their dead and cremate their dead. And this river is, and this place is seen as very holy and special, but yet the pollution that exists on the Ganges River is, is overwhelming. Um, conservation of rivers in India has really become a critical national issue. Um, it's one of the most contaminated rivers in the world. Um, pollution comes from a variety of sources, raw sewage that the sewage plants can't keep up with, industrial waste and whatnot. So just really striking images there. So let's get back to our essential question of the impacts of dense urbanization. Can you think of some that we've talked about today? So we know that urbanization means the movement to cities and it's continuing as people leave rural areas 
and seek better opportunities in urban areas for jobs, um, for education opportunities. But with the influx of people that are coming, cities are having a hard time managing all of that. So having adequate housing, having adequate jobs, um, education and health care, sanitation services, water services. Um, because of that, because of that trouble that cities are having, slums um, and substandard housing continues to pop up and to expand. And then that just leads to more poverty in these areas. Also what we're seeing in a lot of areas is that when the cities grow, urban sprawl tends to replace surrounding land, which could be farmland. So then roads and sewer and water lines have to be built. People are commuting from longer distances coming into the cities. That's contributing to more cars on the road, more pollution in the air, and it's leading to more fuel use and pollution. Speaking of cars on the road, I wanted to mention this, which is an, uh, an in, um, India's highway um, map. Um, they put major uh, money into an infrastructure project to invest in their highways, much like our own um, interstate system. And they wanted to improve the roads and the connectivity between cities and rural areas. And this is called the Golden Quadrilateral. It's basically, um, connecting the major cities in India. It's it led to increased mobility here and leading to economic growth throughout the, the country. Speaking of car sales, um, car use, um, this is a, um, a graphic showing you how car use in India compares to the United States. And you can see for in just in five years, 2002 to 2007, car buying um, in the United States has gone down, but car use, Car buying in India has actually doubled, so that tells you something about their crowded conditions. <clears throat> we want to um, kind of finish up today with looking at some population numbers. So India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, and the United States. Um, according to this, the number of people that live in India is what? So we always want to look at our key. We have population in millions, so don't be fooled. The answer is not A but you're going to have to add six zeros to that to make it millions. So the population, according to this, in 2009 Population Reference Bureau, the population of India is 1.39 billion people, which is coming very close to what China's is. And I'm going to go through these a little bit faster. All right, so which of these natural hazards frequently accompany the summer monsoon season in Bangladesh? Is it landslides and flooding? earthquakes, crop failure and famine, or typhoons? And if you were listening, you would know that the correct answer is landslides and flooding. A final question, which of the following statements are true about monsoon activity in South Asia? Monsoon winds always blow in the same direction. Monsoon winds always bring heavy rainfall. Monsoon winds reverse direction every six months, and monsoons have little effect in South Asia. Well, we know that sometimes they blow from the south and sometimes they blow from the north, and they don't always bring heavy rainfall. And we also know that they have major impacts in South Asia. So the best answer is going to be C. Monsoon winds reverse those directions every six months, but they do impact life there in major ways. Well, this week we've talked about South Asia. Next week we're going to return and we're going to talk about um, East Asia, and those include the countries of China, Korea, Japan. So I hope you'll join us next Wednesday as we talk about East Asia. Thank you for being here. Have a great week.